Hi, I'm Tom, and I got a question for you. Have you ever been this close to a bankruptcy? Probably not, right? Well, it's a terrible experience, I can tell you. It's terrible, of course, for your business. It is also, as a consequence, bad for your team. It may affect your family, and chances are it would also even affect your health. So it is really not a fun thing. So could I recommend it to you? Maybe, maybe not. Let's have a look at that a little bit deeper, no? Because if you want to be an entrepreneur, you have to be also prepared for this type of entrepreneurial near-death experience that I lived through myself. And hopefully, I can share a couple of interesting insights with you. So let me give you a little bit of background. I have what you can call entrepreneurial roots. Okay? My parents had a small business, and pretty much for as long as I remember, I always have thought that I'd like to have one day a business myself. I got that opportunity 18 years ago when actually I got fired in my last job. But that is maybe a topic for another TED Talk, right? So um, I started together with two business partners, a company, and we focused on a concept that at that time in Europe was not yet very well known, namely sourcing services. What we did is we helped companies in the West that wanted to start or improve their purchasing activities in Asia, China, China in particular. And that went actually quite well. For a number of years, it went really good until disaster struck. Disaster meaning the 2008 financial crisis. <clears throat> that crisis had a huge impact on a lot of places, a lot of people, a lot of countries. And among others, it caused that in a number of places, the building industry totally collapsed. Among others, some of the markets where we were active. And we were actually very focused on building tools, building materials, and sourcing these sort of things. No? I can tell you that pretty much 90% of our customers from before the financial crisis, they disappeared. They vanished. They didn't survive that crisis. My business partners as well, they got cold feet. And they sort of wanted to get out. So they left. To be honest, I can't blame them. At that time, it looked pretty bad. But I thought, let's go on a little bit with the sourcing activity. And as they say, the best defense is actually an attack. So I thought, I invest a bit more, I hire some people, and I start an additional activity to balance it out, namely the opposite. I was trying to start a business here, an activity focused on export services, helping companies from here trying to sell in China. Good. So I set up a program that, well, I have to say I'm still a bit proud of it, was really nice. And we managed to convince about 30 producers in six different countries to sign up for us. And we managed, particularly, we were focused on food and beverage. Okay? So we managed to get um, beer, wine, olive oil, sangria, uh, olives themselves, chocolate, a lot of different things. We managed to get that on the shelves of supermarkets in China, get it on internet portals, distributors of all kinds. It was really a fun time. We really enjoyed it. Yet, it didn't work. It didn't work for a number of reasons. But one of the main reasons was that the person standing here in front of you made a couple of basic mistakes. One of the mistakes that I made has to do with a functional area in which, I don't know, I still find it a bit of magic, which is human resources. Selecting people, hiring people. I've hired a lot of people in my life, and actually fantastic people. Some of them are actually still in my company, working for me, fantastic professionals. I'm really proud of them. But I also hired a few that tremendously disappointed me. And it was actually the case in the export activity. Some folks really let me down. And at a certain moment, the situation went so bad that we started really bleeding money. And as you know, cash is the blood of your company. You run out of cash, it's game over. So at a certain point, I saw that coming. I remember we had like a couple of months cash left. It was really a very stressful situation. And I decided to pull the plug on the export activity, much to my regret. At that time, more than half of the staff was dedicated to export. Two-thirds of the staff had to go. Terrible experience. Really not fun to do, but I had to do it. And I think, actually, I'm, it's fair to say that I did it in a decent way, because I'm still on speaking terms with literally all of them. And as a bit of a fun anecdote, a few years afterwards, when I went to China on a sort of combination of business and tourism trip, I took my youngest daughter with me, 
we went, in the very beginning of the trip, we went to the Great Wall near Beijing. And the people who organized the excursion for us were actually a couple, husband and wife, who a few years before had been sort of the main people behind the import formalities of the food and beverage in China. You guessed it, they were fired as well. So during the entire day, I was sort of not entirely sure would they sort of have revenge and push us off the Great Wall, but no, they didn't. They behaved really well. Actually, during lunch, I remember we talked about it again, and we brought up some memories, some fun memories of all the things that we did, and they understood. They still said, hey, no hard feelings. We tried really hard. We worked on it, but eventually it didn't work out too bad, so you took the right decision. Good. So I went on, and I decided to get back to basics. Sourcing it was again. And fortunately, we got that back on track really in a good way. And in the following years, the following sort of four years, we managed to multiply turnover by four, and we got back into profitability, so that was good. On top of that, I'd always kept a little bit of an open mind for alternative opportunities, looking around what was possible. And one of the things was actually suggested by a close family member of mine who said, why don't you go teaching, business teaching? In the beginning, I thought, well, what's, what's that of an idea? But then I did it, and it worked out actually pretty well. It was a bit of a winter activity also, so what was a bit of a plan B also became a plan A. So now I got two plans A, I'm a bit stressed as well, but it's good stress because I'm enjoying all the things that I'm doing, of course, no? So what sort of lessons can we maybe learn from this story? Well, if you are at a certain point confronted with the unthinkable, what do you do? The unthinkable for me was after years working on a business and growing and doing great things and enjoying myself, all of a sudden you're in front of that potential bankruptcy. That sounds like unthinkable. You can't imagine that will actually happen to you. Well, if that happens, you probably also have to dare doing the unthinkable also. And the unthinkable for me, in terms of doing things, meant three things. In the first place, as you guessed it already, I really enjoyed the export activity. And if you want to be a successful entrepreneur, you have to choose an activity that you really love. I love that one. But it wasn't profitable. I was wasting my time. So I had to cut off that part. I was enjoying myself, but it was a waste of time. So stopping an activity that you love really hurts. Okay? It's not great. The second thing is something I mentioned before, is the firing of people. I can assure you there's so many courses on entrepreneurship, and it's all about constructive things, building up things, investing, new products, new services, and hiring new people. They don't tell you a lot about the destructive thing. Okay? And when you're confronted with that, it's really terrible. It's not an enjoyable thing. And the third thing is a bit of a wrap-up, sort of a general thing, is that once at a certain point, you need to face reality. And what I mean with that is a lot of people, actually the vast majority according to statistics, people who have a business, when it doesn't go well, they keep on going. They keep on going. And they, th they keep on thinking, tomorrow will be the better day. Next week, we'll get that order that we're expecting from that customer. Next month, the bank will give us a new loan. And it doesn't happen. And when it doesn't happen, they crash the whole thing. And I don't think that's a fair thing. In my case, I thought it was important to try to save at least the sourcing activity. Those folks, they had nothing to do with what happened in the export activity. It was not their fault. So I tried to save that, and it turned out to be OK. So it's an important lesson as well that you don't crash everything and that you don't leave behind you a trail of, I wouldn't say dead bodies, but lost jobs, lost opportunities, and maybe a lot of people who can't pay anymore their mortgage, who can't go on a holiday because the whole thing crashed. It's just not fair, okay? And an extra sort of conclusion apart from these three things, I think, is that if you do decide to take action, do not hesitate. Go firmly for it. Take the initiative. Go get over with it, okay? Hesitation is your worst enemy. Because hesitation may show weakness. And weakness will be abused by your customers, by your creditors, by your competitors, maybe even by the odds disloyal team member. Fortunately, I didn't have any of those, but it's a very common thing. Okay? So let me get back to my question in the beginning. Is it worthwhile to get through such an experience? Is it really worthwhile? No. 
of course, let's not fool ourselves. Let's try to avoid that, okay? If you have some time in advance that you see trouble coming, take whatever sort of initiative is necessary, but don't get that far, okay? Because it's really stressful. But what happens if eventually you do get bankrupt? It's not the end of the world, okay? Life goes on. Actually, there's a couple of really interesting examples of famous people that we identify with success who always also been through bankruptcy. One that comes to mind is, for instance, Abraham Lincoln. You probably wonder, what does he have to do with this? Well, he started having a store. He set up a store with a partner, and they started buying a lot of materials from here and there on credit, and they overdid it. They overplayed their hand, and all of a sudden, they had a lot of debt, which they couldn't cope with. Now, you have to take into account, in that time, which is more or less sort of the first half of the 19th century, Bankruptcy, and particularly in the U.S., was a very different thing of what it is now. Nowadays, there are mechanisms whereby you can sort of settle certain debts, you can talk to creditors, you can arrange things. It's very formal, okay? You can move on with your life. That was not the case in the time of Lincoln. So he ended up paying off debts for the next 17 years. Can you imagine dragging that pack back with you all the time, no? So then he did another thing, and he started getting into politics. That worked out pretty well for him. Actually, maybe I took the wrong decision in getting in teaching. I don't know. I have to think about it. So, and another good example of somebody who sort of went over a bankruptcy and became very successful is Walt Disney. Walt Disney, about a century ago, he started a small studio doing animated fairy tales. Yeah, that was a thing at that time. So, good. He started going. He had a financial backer, but that backer went bankrupt himself. So he ended up with a lot of debt, couldn't pay his staff, and the whole studio went bankrupt. But a few years afterwards, and that's an important thing, he got a family loan, and he started a new studio. And then he started something with a little mouse, you know, and that actually went out to be a success, and then he transformed into the Walt Disney that we know. So if you do get bankrupt, as I said before, keep an open mind, count on the support of the people that surround you, your family, your contacts, and if you're a good person, I'm quite sure they will help you around. And before you know, off you go for a new entrepreneurial venture. Thank you very much for your attention.